Hey friends, welcome back to Belle's Library. I am finally home from Arizona. We had a really good time, but I am also really happy to be home. <laughs> I get to be home for a couple of months just here, and I don't have a lot on my schedule, and I'm looking forward just to some relaxing time. The weather is getting colder and things are just slowing down. I'm really excited to spend some time at home with my books and my art and just myself. <laughs> Because I was gone, I'm a little bit late getting up my November wrap-up video, but I wanted to go ahead and do that for you guys. Um, I read a ton of books in November, way more than I normally read. That was just really fun for me and a challenge. I'm pretty proud of myself actually for doing that. As I said at the beginning of November, I was really off track with my Goodreads uh, reading challenge goal. And the last few years, I've kind of set that as my gauge as far as, you know, did I have a successful reading year? <laughs> did I complete the goal that I set for myself um, as far as the number of books read? So I was really far behind. I was at 17 uh, behind. And now I'm only at one behind. <laughs> so I really did a lot to catch up this month. Uh, so feeling good about that. So I think that I will finish December with my goal all done. Part of the reason I've been able to catch up quickly is because I've been listening to audiobooks in the car. I'm just pulling up things on YouTube. So if you guys know some good places to find audio recordings or some good readers, <laughs> just let me know if you guys have any good suggestions out there uh, that I can get a hold of. But I've been listening to a few on YouTube and really enjoying that while I'm doing all my errands and stuff, which I used to just listen to just you know, regular whatever videos, but now I listen to the audiobooks and it's helped me catch up quite a bit. So without further ado, let's get into the books I read in November 2023. So the first one up, Kate Morton, The Homecoming. You guys heard me talk about this. Um, this is the one that I got all wet <laughs> and had to pay the library for, uh, but now I have a new Kate Morton in my collection, right? Um, so I have been smashing her down a little bit on the shelf, but she's still a little wider than she should be <laughs> but anyway so this was the first book that I annotated with tabs so for you know my entire life I've annotated books I've written my books and underline and all those sorts of things but I've never used the tabs to sort of just mark where my annotations are that's how I'm using them right now and um, just to mark the things that you know stuck out to me so I could be like oh remember when I read that in Kate Morton what was it and then you know I only have four tabs in this one so it should be easy for me to find my favorite quotes or whatever it is that I'm looking for so I did enjoy this book um, it was sort of a comeback in my opinion for Kate Morton I didn't enjoy the clockmaker's daughter so much which is the book that she released prior to this one and so I was feeling a little frustrated because she's one of my favorite authors but this one did not disappoint I really enjoyed it it has that whole you know modern gothic feel with the old lady and the young girl and the house and the secret in the house and just the whole thing. I love that vibe, whatever it's called. I call it modern gothic. I don't know what other people call it, but anyway, this has that. I liked it. A lot of times what is frustrating to me about reading a mystery is I usually get it pretty much figured out pretty early in. And so that was the case for this book with the big parts. I had it pretty much figured out a couple hundred pages in, but the little parts, surprised me and there was a big surprise at the end that I did not foresee coming. And don't you hate it when you read a book and you recognize yourself in the characters that are not supposed to be likable? <laughs> I did not like the character of Nora in this book very well at all but I think one of the biggest reasons why is because her flaws are some of my flaws and that's just hard to take right? Nobody wants to see their flaws in print. <laughs> But you know, this book really got me thinking and it caused me to make some commitments to myself, to my family, that are going to be good for the emotional health of my family. Uh, so it really spoke to me. I liked this read a lot. This one was a five star read for sure. Okay, so the next one in line, this is called Our Island Story. And this is a book that I have reread several times. Uh, this is something that is on my kids' Uh, reading list every year starting in about I don't know seventh grade maybe um, up through ninth or tenth grade. Our Island Story was written by H.E. Marshall a little over a hundred years ago and it is basically the story of England. It starts off with the stories of Albion and Brutus, goes all through the Romans, it goes through every king and queen up through Queen Victoria 
and um, lots of great illustrations. I love this version. I just love the cover. I think this is such a cool cover. And then the illustrations in it are really good. Um, but the thing that I really love about this book, and this might sound funny, but this is like the best bound book I have ever owned. Uh, I have gone through this book with my children multiple times over the last 15 years or more, and it is just bound so well. <laughs> it's not falling apart at all. Um, so if you want a good made book, Orion Books in the UK, this is a great book <laughs> in all the ways. All right, next up is a children's read called The Book Wanderers. This is actually the first in a set um, by Anna James. And I did enjoy this. I don't really read a whole lot of children's books, so when I do, it's usually classics. But I couldn't resist this cover, right? It is so cute. <laughs> and it looks like so much fun. And so I did pick this up and I enjoyed the story. Um, basically, Tilly is a little girl and she lives with her grandparents. Um, she doesn't know who her father is and she doesn't know where her mother is. So her mother disappeared. Nobody knows where she is apparently. Um, Tilly is 11 years old and she works in her grandparents' bookshop with them. So shortly into the story, she discovers her grandparents talking to people that seem to be from another time. So then she figures out that there is a way that she can travel into her favorite stories. So she goes sort of story hopping on this quest, trying to figure out the mystery of what happened to her mother. It is a fun story. I ended up going and picking up book number two. It's on my shelf over there, uh, and I may get to that here pretty soon. All right, next up was The Fasting Girl by Michelle Stacy. This was one of my Nonfiction November reads. I participated in Nonfiction November with um, the book Olive. And I wanted to reread this one because it is something that I have actually reread several times over the years. It's just one of those really weird Victorian mysteries. I did the whole, you know, book tab thing. It was just fun. Ooh, it feels so interesting. <laughs> just sit there and play with it. Okay. Um, I did the, I did my tabs in there and I just marked a lot of things that, you know, mostly just quotes are like weird things. Like what? One thing that I, well, I'll tell you this after I tell you about the story. Okay, so so this book tells the story of Molly Fancher. She is one of many Victorian fasting girls over the years. <laughs> and basically, um, the idea was that these girls would fast um, from all food or mostly food, food for weeks, food for months, food for years, um, sometimes even water. Okay, that was the story. They were just miraculously living through. So obviously, like, it's ridiculous and totally not possible. And so I've read through this several times over the years. When I read through it this time, I did not remember how much of the story really wasn't centered on Molly, but just on fasting girls in general throughout history. So it was interesting, but it could get kind of dry and you're kind of like, okay, okay, we get it, you know. And I think the thing is that really, if you're just going to tell the story of Molly Fancher, then you're probably only going to have like a, you know, magazine article rather than a full length book and study on uh, the fasting girls. So that's fine. But some of the things that I really got out of this book uh, this time around really didn't have much to do with Molly in specifics. Here at the beginning of the book, it's talking about how the Victorians were just really kind of scared, like terrified about the things that were going on uh, in this new industrialized world. It's just things happened so rapidly. It was very chaotic for them. Um, talking about, you know, just trying to navigate the streets with these rapidly moving vehicles on them. Um, not only were horse cars and railways frightening and dangerous, but riders quickly discovered that mass transit could be noxious as well. It talks about you know, people getting hit by these things or falling off, getting their um, you know, dresses caught in wheels and those sorts of things. You know, this more rapid transit that they had come up with. Um, that would be kind of scary, right? You're used to just kind of strolling along <laughs> to the shop and then here comes a streetcar whizzing by or something. So that was an interesting thought. It kind of helps you understand better why we had all this, you know, mass hysteria and anxiety and things going on with these people. And then it talked a lot also about just this um, strange phenomena of, you know, sickness is trendy. I don't know uh, a better way to put that really. 
Uh, taking to one's bed might also have functioned as a mode of passive aggression, especially in a milieu of which weaknesses was rewarded and which women had since childhood been taught not to express overt aggression. Consciously or unconsciously, the woman had thus opted out of her traditional role. And I wrote, what's the point of life if you can't live? Um, there were a lot of things that, you know, Victorian women were not supposed to be doing. <laughs> Um, we're not allowed to do. I thought about that as I read through Daisy Miller the other day by Henry James. Um, she just did him anyway. <laughs> she just lived her life. But you know, I think this idea of it being a passive aggression, whether they were fasting, whether they were just taking to their sick bed and feigning sickness, um, just these things, those were things they did have control over. Um, although they were the ones who suffered the most from it, at least they were controlling that situation, right? So who knows what I would do in a similar situation. Um, but it says that being an invalid or a semi-invalid in Victorian era was not necessarily considered a bad thing. It marked the sufferer as one possessed of unique sensibility like a poet or a saint. Um, an illness was to be cultivated as a romantic sign of grace. So just thinking that through and then thinking about a lot of the Victorian literature I've read, this puts things in a whole new light. It makes you wonder about people. It makes you wonder about, you know, like Beth from Little Women. Um, was that meant to be a romantic character? Because we read it as a complete tragedy, right? Especially if you are a sister or a mother. Um, but maybe it was supposed to be, you know, a little bit of romanticism in there. Because the more you read Little Women, the older you get, the more you realize <laughs> it's kind of juvenile in some ways. Um, I love it. But you know, anyway, I just wonder, I wonder about all that. So this just is a book that made me think and wonder. Um, I don't see myself rereading again anytime in the near future, just because like I said, it really dragged kind of in the middle. Um, but if it's a subject you're not aware of and have never read about before, you'll probably really enjoy a first read. I'm gonna keep it with my collection um, because it is a book worth coming back to. I think it's a great book for referencing and I'm sure I will read it again somewhere down the road, just not anytime soon. <laughs> so this is unlike things that I usually read, um, but I picked this up kind of spur of the moment, Redemption Song by Bertice Berry. One thing, I loved the cover art. Look at how beautiful that woman is. I just thought, just, oh, I love that picture so much. Um, so that really struck me. And then um, it was just kind of a short, interesting read. I could tell it was just going to really bring out an atmosphere um, and a feeling within a culture that I am not familiar with. And I really wanted that challenge and just kind of that eye-opening um, understanding. And I did get some of that from this little novella. So this is a dual timeline story. Um, we have Iona and Joe who lived in the 1800s and they were both slaves. And then we have Fina and Ross who live in modern times. And they are both in search of the same manuscript that was written during the times of slavery in America. And they go to this shop um, something leads both of them to go to this shop. They don't know each other and they meet there and they both get there at the same time looking for the same manuscript. So it's like, you know, it's not so believable at all. It's the story is really kind of a folk tale. It's one of those, it's something that you could see being passed down sort of orally uh, to tell a bigger story, right? So I, I kind of saw it more as a, as a folk tale than, um, you know, a, a, a standard novella, I guess. But anyway, so they meet at this uh, shop at the same time, and then the proprietor of the shop, Miss Cozy, she, you know, of course was anticipating their coming, and so she says they can look at this manuscript all they want, but they cannot take it out of the store, and um, they can only look at it together. So she is matchmaking right from the beginning. But as you go along, you realize that Miss Cozy sort of expected this to happen, and so um, they learn the story of Iona and Joe through this manuscript. The story as a whole is very much meant to sort of stir up and encourage the black community, I think, um, you know, to, to be your best and to um, rise up to your full potential. Although the story does seem to be directed at the black community and that, um, that culture within the greater American culture, um, I think that the messages in this book can actually just apply to all humanity and the more we learn about them, the better society as a whole we're going to be. 
it talks a lot about loving one another and uh, just being able to work together and um, but also loving yourself and um, recognizing the potential and, and the character the good character that's inside of you what you can accomplish and achieve and you know sort of give to society I did enjoy this book um, I enjoyed the story of Iona Joe the older story much more it was written differently um, it was written very well and from a very um, sort of lyrical standpoint the modern story of Fina and Ross I didn't enjoy so much um, I do think this is a beginner novel for the author and uh, and maybe that's why I could see sort of a difference there or maybe it was just meant like I said to be something that is told as a folktale and they're not known for their heavy character development right so anyway if this sounds interesting this Redemption Song by Bertice Berry. You might want to check that one out. All right, next up is Fever 1793 by Lori Halsey Anderson. This was a reread for me. It had been probably 10 years, maybe a little less, the, uh, since I had read this last. Um, and it's a children's novel about the yellow fever epidemic of 1793. This book takes place in Philadelphia. And it just talks about a young girl and her family and all the things that they went through during this plague. She stayed in Philadelphia where many other people chose to leave um, the town. And so she just kind of talks about the things that she went through and the challenges and overcoming. So this was an interesting book to read. I think reading a children's version of whatever it is you're interested in is a great introduction to kind of get the gist of an idea. And then, of course, you can always go back and read something a little meatier um, if you find that you want to know more. So... Fever 1793, Lori Halsey Anderson. That one's a good one. All right, the next book that I read was called The Englishman Who Posted Himself. This is by John Tingy or Tingy, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, this was fun. It had a lot of illustrations or just, you know, a lot of photographs of things in it. So basically, this 19th century guy, he um, was the king of postal experiments. So all these things that I'm showing you are pieces of mail that he sent out um, some of them he received back some of them have since been found and uh, added to this collection that these people have made of <laughs> this guy's correspondent so if I understand this right this guy William Bray found like a postal um, catalog or regulation book okay so the postal regulations had recently been written or rewritten he found a a manual that sort of laid them all out and he decided to test them <laughs> and so he started sending things in the mail um, without a package okay so he sent a turnip and he carved the address into the turnip and it ended up going through the mail just fine um, he has sent other things like a shirt collar um, I don't remember what all just a bunch of crazy stuff he, then he ended up sending his dog then he ended up sending himself and so I think he sent himself like three times and so the postal worker would you know accompany him to his home because he's sending himself you know back home accompany him to his home his father would sign for him that he had received him and then um, Mr. Bray would be delivered back to his house so just funny things like that then he decided to start um, a postal collection of things that he could um, keep or that would go off into you know the big wide world so he started sending out different postcards that asked for people's autographs and um, said you know do you autograph this and send it back to me because I guess the guy acquired like thousands and thousands of postcards doing this uh, with people's signatures on them he would send out a postcard maybe with a landmark on it like a big you know boulder that's uh, at the edge of the sea and he would say deliver this postcard to the person who lives nearest this boulder and you know it'd be like boulder or devonshire or whatever and so he would send it and then the postman in that area would deliver it to the person who lives nearest that boulder and then if they couldn't you know do that then they would send it back to him and he would just add that postcard to his collection and then sometimes on the postcard he would say please send back to me so the person who lived nearest the boulder would you know, write something whatever send it back to him so he could have it for his collection uh, he did all kinds of stuff like this so a lot of his postcards and letters are still out there but a lot of them came back to him and he amassed this huge collection there's a picture in here of him with his collection and his daughter or granddaughter so I guess the story goes, what's happened now is this author 
found some of his collection, wondered about the guy, did some research, and it turned out that his daughter or granddaughter was still living and also had part of the collection. So I think between the two of them, they have collaborated to try and find as much of this collection as they can and put it all back together again. So there is a lot, lot, way more to this story than what I just told you, but it was very interesting, especially if you were interested in you know, postal series of um, the history of the postal service, mailing letters. If you like having pen pals yourself, all that stuff, you will probably really enjoy this book. Um, as I have said in previous videos, I run a, a group called the Victorian Letter Writers Guild. It's an international pen pal society for women, and so you guys can check that out in the link in my description box. But this book was read right up my alley because I love reading about anything that has to do with. Um, letter writing and postal experiments or just postal stuff in general and I actually I wish I would have saved one so I could show you guys but I made some little postcards that I um, just sort of left around mostly in little free libraries with books that I was leaving around on my Arizona trip and the postcards have like four or five questions for the person to answer and then they're already addressed to me with a stamp on them and my, then on the other side I just ask that they drop it in the mail at their earliest convenience to be a part of my postal experiment. So we'll see if I get any of those back. If I do I'll be sure to share that with you guys. Alright and the next up again was another reread that I hadn't read in over 10 years. This is The Lifted Veil by George Eliot. I am not yet a George Eliot fan though I am willing to give her a try. I read Silas Marner and I really did like it um, but I did not like Adam Bede and this one was just kind of like, I don't know, neither here nor there. I didn't love it. I didn't hate it. It was just, it was a story of this guy who basically has these visions and uh, he becomes obsessed with his brother's fiance and uh, he has all these visions of things that are going to happen and then they happen um, but it's only for a short period of his life he's clairvoyant uh, from what I understand George Eliot actually stopped writing the mill on the floss so that she could write this real quick so I'm kind of imagining her just like you know she's sitting at her desk she's been writing at mill of the floss all day long she's kind of exhausted she's kind of done and so she sets it aside and she's just like, I need a break. And then the story is there. Maybe it was a side story that was supposed to take place within Mill and Floss and she just couldn't find a way to work it in. Or maybe she's just like, I have to do something else. Uh, because you know, it's not like awesomely written and it's not very much in depth and it's just kind of creepy and weird. <laughs> but it's a quick read and it gave me one more point on my Goodreads list, so yay for me. Thank you George Eliot for writing The Lifted Veil and I will probably put it away for at least another 10 years. <laughs> Alright, next up is this book called Adventures from the Past. This was written by my grandmother who has since passed away, uh, Grace Estes. Um, I'm just gonna be blunt. <laughs> it's not that great and before you think that I'm a horrible person because it's my grandmother, she's actually my estranged grandmother and I really never had much of a relationship with her. Um, she didn't come around very much, but uh, she did, toward the end of her life, bring this book over. It's really a random jumble of... I don't know what. So it's basically a book of all kinds of random stories that she came up with, maybe. Um, because as I'm reading through this, some of this stuff is very encyclopedic. <laughs> and some of it she probably wrote out. Um, the first couple of stories are um, okay. They just need a little bit of editing. Then you get to the story about the fairies and you realize that she has just blatantly pilfered this photo of the Cottingley fairies um, for a story that has nothing to do with the Cottingley fairies. So I would like to publicly apologize to the Cottingley family. Please don't sue me. Uh, but then we get into some stories on medieval castles, um, but then after that it just kind of all goes really wonky because apparently this is supposed to be a story book written for children, but she starts talking about medieval battles um, and uh, knights and things and there is a lot of like blood and gore that's a little much for kids in my opinion. Uh, then she starts talking about this like satanic werewolf dog that needs like a town full of 
crucifix wielding villagers to get rid of it. There's talk of people hanging themselves and undead people. But maybe the weirdest thing of all about this book is that when she brought it over to my kids back in 2013, she sat down to read us a story about a spaceman. And she told a whole story about a spaceman with this book open like this. But when you read the book, there is nothing about a spaceman anywhere in it. <laughs> so did she just like make it up on the fly? Cause that was pretty impressive actually. <laughs> this book is weird, but my grandma, she was weirder. <laughs> and it is kind of special to have this just because I didn't really know her very well. She wasn't around very much. And um, so this gives a little taste of maybe how her mind worked which could be good or <laughs> let's move on. All right, this next little book I picked up when I was in England in 2016, I'm pretty sure, yeah. And when I was in Bath, and uh, it's one of the little black classics, which I have not seen these. Does anybody know where we can get these in the US? I have not seen these like at my Barnes and Noble or that's pretty much where I shop for new books. Um, other than shopping for them online. Um, but they're kind of fun looking. They're just this little tiny, little tiny story. Um, and this is called The Beautiful Cassandra. This is a, a set of short stories that Jane Austen had written before, you know, she published anything that we are normally familiar with. And they're funny, okay? But when you go onto Goodreads, people don't get this. <laughs> they're like, what did I just read? And just now I'll never read Jane Austen. And this is so obnoxious. And they are obnoxious. They're meant to be. I mean, they are literally just completely obnoxious. In fact, this last story is just like two paragraphs basically. Is all about, it's a letter <laughs> written by this person, Anna Parker, who has plans on murdering her sister. And But there's a couple things she has to do first. And then now it ends. I am now going to murder my sister. It's just silly, right? It's just supposed to make people laugh. She wrote it for her family to have a laugh. Um, so, so if you find this, take it lightly. It's meant to be taken lightly. A lot of people don't realize how funny Jane Austen is. She wasn't some stuffy, you know, spinster sort of person who just say stuffed up in her house all the time being stuffy. She was actually super funny. Um, and all of her books have quite a bit of humor in them. Uh, and it's just a humorous look at, you know, humanity. Nothing stuffy about her. She was as much female Charles Dickens as she could be in the era that she was writing, in my opinion. Uh, but this book definitely brings out the ridiculousness of Jane Austen. So find it if you can. Um, like I said, I think there's maybe five stories in this, all things that she wrote as a teenager. Really fun. All right, on the heels of Jane Austen, I read Mark Twain in Hawaii. Uh, really ironically actually because the reason that I can't stand Mark Twain and vowed to never even pick up anything by him was because of his comments on Jane Austen which I was posthumously offended for her. <laughs> he didn't like her so much um, and so I don't like him so much. And I really actually didn't like him before that but it just gave me one more reason not to like him. But I did come across this um, book, it's sort of a travel memoir of his time in Hawaii. I think it's actually excerpts from a larger book that he wrote. I started off reading this and thinking, okay, maybe I should give him a chance. He's actually kind of funny. His humor is a lot like my dad's was and so, you know, he was sort of growing on me a little bit, but it didn't take long for me to change my mind because he is kind of a hypocritical, arrogant, colonial-minded teaser. I did not enjoy uh, him and his narrative at all. So there's that. But I did enjoy some of the history that he put in this little book. For instance, he talks about the taboo of deeming it pollution to eat in the same uh, hut that a person slept in. The fact that the patient was dying could not modify the rigid etiquette. So he's talking about this person who's dying and they move the guy to a different hut to feed him and then bring him back into this hut, even though he's very sick and dying because it was just bad luck, it was a taboo, superstition, can't do that. 
I thought it was interesting he talks about the city of refuge uh, in here because uh, at one point he says where did these isolated pagans get the idea of a city of refuge this ancient oriental custom and I thought that was interesting because that all comes from Joshua 20 in the Bible um, where he always sets up the different cities of refuge for people and so this culture is still perpetuating that, um, that way that he set up for them so long ago and then I also just wrote some notes in here on Kilauea um, because he mentions Kilauea and um, we obviously have had a lot of activity lately um, and so I wrote a little bit in here on that but when I pulled this off my shelf I realized there's a piece of paper sticking in here and this came from the guy who sent it to me I ordered it off of paperback swap so you can look at paperbackswap.com it's basically a place to trade books online um, but he sends me this letter dated November 3rd 2019 Hi Sarah, warning, that which follows is an advertisement. Mark Twain is one of my favorite authors. Hawaii is my favorite place to live. Both my wife and I were born and raised in Michigan. After several years of marriage, we mutually agreed that the weather here was awful to live with. So we moved to Hawaii and lived there for 39 years. We moved back to Michigan to care for her mother. However, the mother has passed on and we're suffering in the cold. And last year we took a winter vacation back to where we used to live with a view to consider returning. This winter we're headed to Florida to see if that might be an option, although Hawaii is the best. Best food, best culture, best weather, best everything, except the cost of living, politics, and infrastructure. But still the best place to live. I hope you enjoy your new book and I recommend a visit to Hawaii. So I thought that was thoughtful of the guy to take the time to write me a little note in there. And overall, I did enjoy reading the travel memoir part, just not the um, social commentary by this very sort of detestable person who is okay with mocking and belittling this culture and Jane Austen. All right, and then finally, the last book that I read in November was Animal Farm, and I didn't actually read it. I listened to it in the car. Uh, that was my first um, audiobook, as you know, recently. And it was really weird because when I started it, I thought I had not read it since high school, which was a really long time ago. <laughs> 97 almost 30 years ago uh, so anyway I thought I had not read it since then but when I pulled up my Goodreads I realized I actually just read it in 2021 a uh, side note just that that is what grief does to a person right I had lost my father and then uh, I just completely forgot that I had ever read this book didn't remember anything it was about didn't remember the characters I don't remember anything and that was just a couple of years ago so that's just super weird but I really liked the narrator on this uh, version of Animal Farm. He breaks out into song when he's singing their Beast of England song, and he's just fantastic. He talks about socialism, uh, the abuse of power. Uh, it was written probably specifically to address current situations in the 1940s, uh, but it can be used for any time. And, um, and it's sad, right? And we gotta be really careful when we have a power vacuum who we allow to fill it. Anyway great story. All right, guys, that is my November 2023 wrap up. Quite a bit of reading there. This video went on way longer than I had planned. <laughs> quite a bit of reading there, but quite a bit of rambling on my part. So I hope you guys are all having a great weekend, a great time of reading. Um, be watching for my Nathanuary reading challenge. That's going to be coming up for January, where we read at least one work by the American author Nathaniel Hawthorne, who is one of my personal favorites. I'll be making a few videos that talk about why I enjoy him, things that he, I've read by his that I um, love, and I will be picking a work by him to read during Nathanuary that I have not yet read before, so that will be fun for me. So be watching for that. Otherwise, I will see you guys soon. Bye-bye.